What's up with Laura Barton and that fancy shield Rolex? Why didn't we get more pizza dog? Hawkeye was a hoot, but it left fans with some burning questions. Oddly enough, in a show that includes several unrepentant criminals and killers, Eleanor Bishop might be the most raging sociopath of them all. Kate's impressively manipulative mother reacts to her arrest for first-degree murder as if it was a particularly mean-spirited personal attack. It seems she's hardly overflowing with remorse for the slaying of Armand Duquesne, and who knows how many other crimes she committed on Kingpin's behalf. How could you do this? I handled Armand like you all these years. Now that Kate's partly responsible for her mom presumably serving a lengthy prison sentence, she may no longer have access to the Bishop family cash. However, if she gets a side gig waiting tables, how will this facilitate her inevitable first meetings with the rest of the Young Avengers? That's where this is all heading, right? Valentina Allegra de Fontaine is presumably putting together a Thunderbolts team composed of copycat Avengers, which includes US Agent and Yelena Belova as the new Black Widow. And they'll take on a Young Avengers team led by Kate, right? Well, that's just a guess. What we know for sure is Hawkeye ends with Kate enjoying Christmas with the Bartons. Will she chill at the farm for a while? Head back to New York? Blast into space for an adventure with the Guardians of the Galaxy? The possibilities are limitless. Yelena Belova doesn't appear until the closing minutes of Episode 4, but Florence Pugh nevertheless walks away with this whole series. Oddly enough, she does not walk away with Black Widow. The 2021 feature length in which she premieres as Natasha Romanoff's adopted sister. It could be that the lighter tone and premise of Hawkeye lends itself to a funnier Yelena than the more serious Black Widow could get away with. As Hawkeye comes to a close, Yelena's mission to execute Clint Barton is a total wash, but she gets some degree of emotional closure for the death of her sister. At the moment, there doesn't seem to be more stuff for Yelena to do, except possibly to seek out and mentally liberate any remaining brainwashed Black Widows and await instructions from Valentina Allegra de Fontaine. Pugh and Haley Steinfeld also demonstrate impressive on-screen chemistry within relatively short periods of time. So while it's well and good to root for a Hawkeye and Black Widow show starring the two somewhere down the line, let's remember that they can be bitter enemies and still banter. Starting with Avengers Age of Ultron from all the way back in 2015, the MCU hammers on the idea that its version of Clint Barton would much rather be out on his farm with his wife and kids than doing superhero stuff. Being an Avenger is essentially a very dangerous chore for this man. Hawkeye triples down on Clint's frustration with his apparent inability to ever stay in dad mode for as long as he'd like. He frequently voices his desire to wrap up this ordeal so he can get back to the Barton farm for Christmas. Indeed, the show tells us family is the most important thing in the world to Hawkeye. Despite that, he casually destroyed Maya Lopez's family at one point and evidently did this because Wilson Fisk wanted him to. It's one thing if Echo loses interest in Clint as a target and, upon learning that her father's death was pretty much King Ben's idea, refocuses her wrath elsewhere. It's another thing if the MCU keeps hand-waving away Clint's post-snap pre-blip years as the bloodthirsty slaughter machine Ronin. After all, Frank Castle's tra-la-la attitude about taking the lives of other human beings frequently puts him at odds with his fellow superheroes. Why does everyone seem so eager to let Hawkeye off the hook? After the defeat of Thanos at the conclusion of 2019's Avengers Endgame, the MCU has lacked a looming threat with the final boss energy of Josh Brolin's purple space fascist. Could Kingpin become the MCU's new final boss? Okay, sure, Echo appears to put a bullet in him at the end of Hawkeye, but frankly, unless we see a corpse, we've got to assume Wilson Fisk still lives and shall resume menacing denizens of New York City sooner or later. Wilson Fisk re-emerged into live-action Marvel at the conclusion of Episode 5, in the role of secret evil mastermind alongside the shocking revelation that Eleanor Bishop was involved in his schemes. As far as the kingpin goes, there's lots of stuff Hawkeye doesn't tell us. How did Fisk get out of prison, where he absolutely appeared to be headed for an indefinite duration at the conclusion of Daredevil Season 3? Why does he apparently wear a Hawaiian shirt and a fedora now? Where's Vanessa? 
Does he have a long-term plan to fix his city by destroying it and building it back up, or is he simply hoarding as much wealth and power as possible? Is Bullseye still lurking somewhere out on the fringes? Clint spends a decent amount of Hawkeye chasing down a MacGuffin in the form of a Rolex watch recovered from Avengers Tower It could be used to reveal the identity of a retired former co-worker. Some folks figured this ex-colleague of Hawkeye's might be Nick Fury, which would make sense as he factors heavily into the upcoming Secret Invasion series. A few of us also wondered if the Rolex might connect us to Agent Phil Coulson, seeing as how the MCU has been tossing its fair share of old toys back in the sandbox as of late, but the most prescient among us correctly guessed that the Rolex contained the identity and location of Laura Barton which explains why Clint was especially concerned about it falling into the wrong hands. We've got 90 seconds to find the watch. Everything else is secondary. Let's go, bro. But if Laura Barton used to be a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent, what did she do? We don't know. But since she appears knowledgeable about and indifferent towards Clint's highly homicidal activities as Ronan, we can safely guess her job got a little gnarlier than transcribing emails and fetching coffee. When Clint takes a bathroom break from Rogers the Musical during episode 1, he notices someone has scribbled Thanos was right in Sharpie marker on a sink. In rapid succession, Clint is confronted with one side of the culture that turns the horrors he experienced during the Battle of New York into sugary pop entertainment, while the other side consists of clueless edgelords who performatively idolize the cosmic demon that temporarily killed Clint's family and permanently killed a few of his teammates. It's a poignant moment that's totally undermined by that Thanos was right coffee mug a few episodes later. Let's set the whole genocidal snap aside for a moment for the sake of making a point. If a bad guy was directly responsible for a situation that caused your best friend to fall off a cliff to her death, how comfortable would you be drinking hot cocoa out of that bad guy's unofficial fan merchandise? Have you ever heard of LARPing? LARPing? Hmm. Is that some sort of leisure activity? Why does Hawkeye, the show, think LARPing is so funny? Once Grills, the LARPer, lifts Clint's old Ronin uniform from the smoldering ashes of Kate's apartment, Clint tracks him down at an outdoor live-action role-playing event. Afterward, Grill's LARPing organization inexplicably remains involved in various goings-on throughout the rest of Hawkeye. The show appears to assume we will all find the notion of adults engaged in sword and sorcery-themed fantasy combat scenarios insanely quirky and charming. LARPing-related references and humor felt fresh in 2009, when lifestyle sections of newspapers published articles that winkingly declared nerds are counterintuitively cool here in the eerily soothing early phase of Obama's America. LARPing is still a thing, of course, but it hasn't been the subject of frequent media attention for some time. The LARPing stuff in Hawkeye just feels awkward, dated, and a little like the show is poking fun at geeks with unusual hobbies, which is an awfully strange decision for a Marvel show. A better version of Hawkeye might have been 7, 8, or maybe even 10 episodes. There's a lot going on, and Hawkeye sometimes falters in its effort to keep way too many plates spinning at once. Inevitably, some characters feel underserved, and that's especially the case for Jack Duquesne, aka The Swordsman, until episode 6. At the beginning of Hawkeye, Jack seems poised as the series' central big bad. By the end of episode 5, he's the fifth-tier threat underneath Kingpin, Echo, Eleanor Bishop, and Yelena Belova. By episode 6, it's clear that he's not really a villain at all. Hopefully, there's life after Hawkeye for the swordsman. Tony Dalton's blend of cavalier swashbuckler and oblivious comedy relief certainly has potential as a foil for other second-string Avengers on a different series. When Disney Plus announced a Hawkeye show that would feature Clint Barton and Kate Bishop, some fans of Matt Fraction and David Aha's indispensable 2012 series envisioned a live-action version of this standard-setting sequential art saga. We always knew the show couldn't be a direct adaptation of the comic. The MCU's Clint is a stoic family man, whereas the Clint of Marvel Comics at the time is a cynical, damaged bachelor. Only some of Fraction's Hawkeye takes place during Christmas, as opposed to the whole story. 
Iron Man appears in the comic, but Tony Stark is obviously unavailable to do anything in the MCU at this juncture. To its credit, the Disney Plus Hawkeye manages to combine street-level combat with espionage and intrigue that have global implications, and definitely stays true to some aspects of Fraction's Hawkeye. Sadly, one element that should have been easy to transfer to Disney Plus is one of the show's bigger letdowns. With all due respect to talented canine actor Jolt, Lucky the Pizza Dog has nothing to do on TV's Hawkeye. He shows up in the first episode, Kate rescues him, and then he spends the rest of the series waiting around for someone to take him for a walk. Lucky is a crucial component in the comics, but the show essentially reduces him to living iconography. Seriously, Disney has tons of practice with stories about animals who save the day. How did they drop the ball on this one? We realize the television program's relative resemblance to a comic book from 10 years ago isn't really a meaningful criterion of quality. Most viewers don't care that Clint, not Kate, is supposed to rescue Lucky from the tracksuits, or that Clint is supposed to explain the effectiveness of boomerang arrows to Kate, not the other way around. But if Disney Plus wants to make it up to the many, many comics nerds it is disappointed by deviating from the source material it never actually promised it would follow, then it should send Kate Bishop and Lucky to Los Angeles for the presently assumed Season 2 and follow the events collected in Volume 3 of the Hawkeye trade paperbacks. Kate gets tired of Clint's BS and moves to LA, where the events of Hawkeye No. 16 lead her to help an obvious Brian Wilson proxy out of a terminal funk. Disney Plus adapting this story would attract and merge their demographics of MCU diehards and boomer pop obsessives. Plus, it would be a lot of fun to see Kate and Lucky out on the West Coast. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about the MCU are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.